Friends gathered together for this wonderful occasion of commissioning Secretary Purdue to this very important portfolio in our country. Uh, Jim, thank you for giving me the honor of saying a few words. And uh, Secretary, sir, if I were in this part of the world, you can be sure I would have been there to attend this, but I am on another continent uh, ministering, and uh, so taping this just before I left for these commitments in Italy and on to Spain and so on. Uh, I just want to say this to you, uh, former Governor Purdue and Secretary Purdue, and I remember when I was introducing you to a friend of mine at the Rose Garden recently, you looked at him and said, and what's wrong with Sonny? Uh, that tells me everything about you and so much I had already known. You know, in a climate of uh, such hostility, sir, you have been an example of grace and courtesy, civility and kindness. In a climate where so many are clamoring for power, you have shown the humility that it takes to serve the people in this calling. And I well remember when the climate was not cooperating years ago and the weather was quite hostile as well, while we were in the period of drought, you called the state to prayer and how wonderfully God answered our prayer. Truly, Secretary Purdue, you are a man for all seasons. And in this season of your life, as you and Mary serve in Washington, serve your Lord whom you love so dearly and the people whom you care for so much, may God give you the best years ahead for you. I'm always uh, proud in my heart in the best sense of the term when your name is mentioned and whoever is with me, I say, I know him with great delight and what a privilege it is. God bless the Purdue family as you serve. Thank you for allowing me to have this brief word. The scriptures tell us, them that honor me will I also honor, says the Lord. And it was really in service to God and to the people that that uh, scripture was mentioned. You are now honoring God in this call. It would have been easy for you to sit back here and enjoy the comforts of home and family, but you have gone to serve. You have honored God all of your life. He has honored you and will honor you. Thank you for honoring us with your friendship and your example. I also pray that I could someday rise to the level of your dedication, godliness, and example. God bless you, sir. It's a privilege to call you friend and a servant of Christ. That was great. I have the opportunity to introduce both of our speakers tonight, both of our main speakers who will come and share a brief word with you, uh, the first of which is Dr. Benny Tate, who serves at Rock Spring Church in Milner, Georgia. And I can remember the first time I traveled to Rock Springs Church in Milner, Georgia. I thought we were going out to the middle of nowhere. And in fact, Pastor Benny got up and said, right here where our church's zip code is E-I-E-I-O. I remember you saying that. Uh, out in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, but then when the church began, just floods and floods of people began to come from all over the place uh, outside of Jackson to Rock Springs Church. Truly a work of God. And I'm thankful for Dr. Benny Tate. He's been a friend to my dad and my mom and to our family. Thank you for your faithful service at Rock Springs. And thank you for coming tonight to say a word. Would you welcome Dr. Benny Tate? Thank you, Brother Jim. Well, good evening and great to be here. And it is my honor and it is my privilege to be asked just to share a little bit tonight, I have great appreciation for Brother Sonny and Miss Mary and have for many, many years when Brother Jim texted me and said, Pastor Benny, I want you to share, I began to pray and think about what could I share. And I could probably share some funny things, some stories, but what I'd really like to do, I'd like to just leave them with something from the Word of God that would possibly and I truly believe would be a great help to them. The scriptures found in Joshua chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, this is what it says. It says, And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, 
and the priest and the Levites bearing it. Then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way before. You've not passed this way before. Now the Israelites had seen much. God had dried up the Red Sea. They had experienced sunbeam bread from heaven. They had experienced water from a rock. A pillar of cloud led them in the day and a pillar of fire by night. But they come to the Jordan. The very same river in 2010 that Brother Sonny and Miss Mary and I went to on a trip to Israel. They come to Jordan and literally they're getting ready to cross Jordan. And the scripture tells us you've not been this way before. I thought about Brother Sonny and Miss Mary, what accomplished lives with their family and success. I thought about him serving in the Georgia Senate thought about the eight years that he served as our governor during difficult times and did a superb job. And I thought about all the experience. But now they've come to something that they've never been to before. We've never passed this way before. And I want you to see three things, three quick things from the text. The first thing I want you to see is this. The Jordan is a picture of God's faithfulness. The Jordan is a picture of God's faithfulness. I've been married for 33 years, and I remember being in bed one night. I said to Barbara, I said, you know, Barbara, I'd rather die as be unfaithful to you. She said, don't worry. If you do, you will. But I want to report to you, ladies and gentlemen, that our God is a faithful God. And Hebrews 10 and 23 says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith, for he is faithful that had promised. And we're un when we're unfaithful, I found God is still faithful. And this is what I believe. I believe every leader will have a water experience in their life. Moses had the Red Sea. A generation later, Joshua had the Jordan. Elijah, the time of the kings, he had the Jordan. Elijah had the Jordan. And every leader will face a water experience. But I truly believe if we will allow it, the water experience, ladies and gentlemen, will show us the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God. See the Jordan. It's a picture of God's faithfulness. But there's a second thing that I see from the story. The journey is about a relationship, not a road map. The journey is about a relationship and not a road map. See the Ark of the Covenant eventually ended up in the Holy of Holies. It's a typology of Jesus Christ. And you've got to understand something. Up to this time, they would move and they would take the ark with them. They would move and they would take the ark with them. But God said, I want that to change. I want when you see the ark move, that's when I want you to move. When you see the ark move, that's when I want you to move. See, I believe all Christians have Jesus. I believe all Christians have the Holy Spirit. God doesn't dissect the Trinity when we get saved. All Christians have the Holy Spirit. But I want to report to you, not all Christians are led by the Holy Spirit. Not all Christians follow the ark when it moves. You know... I thought about this in my early life. 
I followed the Lord a lot of times out of fear. But I am grateful I've reached the point that I don't want to follow him so much out of fear. I want to follow him out of love. Out of what he has done in my life. See, in that verse 4, God said to the children of Israel, you stay a half a mile away from the ark. Because see, if you got up real close on the ark, Brother Jim, everybody couldn't see the ark. Everybody couldn't see the ark. But if you're half a mile away, you can see the ark. Because this journey, it's about a relationship. It's not about a road map. You know, many times in politics, folks, we position for here for, to position for there. And I hear preachers talking about, I'm going to retire one day. And folks, you may disagree with me, and you're entitled to your own opinion, no matter how wrong it may be. But folks, I know nothing about retirement. I know about a relationship with God. And if we have a relationship with God, it's not we've got things road map. It's we've got to follow the ark, and we've got to do what God wants us to do. I commend Brother Sonny and Miss Mary for not following a road map, but following a relationship and wanting to please the Lord. Let me tell you the last point, and I'm done. If you get finished before I do, just slip out. The joy of life, the joy of life is pleasing God and serving others. The joy of life is pleasing God and serving others. Greatest preacher I ever heard preach, other than Johnny Hunt, was Adrian Rogers. And Adrian Rogers said, if you please God, it doesn't matter who you don't please, but if you don't please God, it doesn't matter who you do please. But the joy of life is pleasing God and serving others. I thought about this text, and you know, I thought about Moses, Brother Sonny. He came to the Red Sea, and it parted. But you said, that, that's wonderful. But, but, but Pharaoh was behind him. I mean, get real. The Egyptians was going to kill him. He had no choice but to tackle the Red Sea. But when Joshua came to Jordan, Jim, there was nobody behind him in the wilderness. He could have stayed in the wilderness. Brother Son and Miss Mary, I came to your home. You were getting ready for retirement. This wasn't your plan. You could have stayed in the wilderness. But how do you make God laugh? Just tell him your plans. You could have stayed. There was nothing behind you. And I commend you. I commend you for realizing. The joy of life is pleasing God and serving others. The only reason for power, the only reason for power is to empower. The only reason God promotes us is to put us in a position so we can help other people. And I know that's what Brother Sonny Purdue would do. He'll take that position and he'll use it to help other people. Because Brother Sonny Purdue realizes when God blesses us, he's got more than us in mind. I thought about this. I share this story and I'm finished. I am looking forward to hearing Brother Johnny's had a great impact on my life. More than he'll ever know. February the 11th, 1861, there was a tall president. His name was Abraham Lincoln. Somebody accused President Abraham Lincoln. They said, Abraham Lincoln, you're two-faced. He said, if I was two-faced, I wouldn't wear this one. <laughs> but he was leaving Springfield, Illinois, a railroad depot, and he gave this word. He said, my friends, no one not in my situation can appreciate my feeling of sadness at this parting. 
to this place and to the kindness of these people, I owe everything. Here I've lived a quarter of a century, and I've passed from a young to an old man. Here my children have been born, and one is buried. I now leave, not knowing when or whether ever I may return, with a task before me greater than me, that which rested upon Washington. Without the assistance of a divine being, whoever attended him, I cannot succeed. Without that assistance, with that assistance, I cannot fail. Trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good. Let us confidently hope that all will yet be well. To his care commending you as I hope in your prayers. You commend me. I bid you an affectionate farewell. God bless you, Brother Sonny. God bless you, Miss Mary. It's been my honor to be a part of this service tonight, Brother Jill. I'm not all dressed up like you guys are. Uh, of course, you kind of have to be. There you are at this wonderful ceremony, installing Sonny Perdue as the brand new Secretary of Agriculture. Let me just mention a couple of things. First, I am ecstatic that my good friend and the longtime governor of Georgia is now the Secretary of Agriculture in the Trump administration. I don't believe the president could have picked anyone in America who's better fitted and able to do this job than Sonny Perdue. As someone who has worked in agriculture all of his life, somebody who understands the issues, but who is also a true statesman, knows how to get things done, but how to get them done right, Sonny Perdue is the perfect choice. But there's another reason I'm excited because you guys are all dressed up. I'm out on the beach. I'm casual. And I kind of like it this way. So I wanted to do the congratulatory moment to say congratulations to Sonny and to Mary, to your family and all your friends. But I also, I wanted to rub it in just a little. That while you're all dressed up with a necktie up around your neck, I'm out here on the beaches of Northwest Florida, enjoying the sunshine, having a great time, dressed down, and so glad that you, you, my friend, are there. God bless you, Sonny. I really wish you the very best. That was great, wasn't it? Leave it to Mike Huckabee. I have the privilege of uh, introducing our next speaker who has had an incredible impact in my life and in my ministry and uh, served as my mom and dad's pastor for eight years when they were living in Atlanta, I was the pastor at First Baptist Church Woodstock and has been there for so many years. Uh, pastor Johnny Hunt and Miss Janet are here with us tonight and I met several folks who come down from Woodstock this afternoon. And do me a favor tonight, do not ask who my dad's favorite pastor is, okay? All right, we don't, nobody needs to know that answer, all right? I've had the privilege of serving as his pastor and so has Pastor Johnny. And so, Pastor Johnny, thank you so much for being here tonight. Come share a few words. Would you welcome me, please? Thanks, well, I, along with everyone in this room, consider it a real privilege and honor to be here. And it was a great joy to uh, serve as their pastor. And they did there what they do here, and that is teach Bible study for eight years at Woodstock. Uh, I'm not going to say who, but someone said today, I'll never forget, we were down in this area and you were preaching, and I saw a little sign beside the road years ago, and it said, Sonny Perdue for governor, to which he responded and said, huh, he doesn't have a prayer. And I said, and what we found out is that's all he did have. <laughs> and so uh, it is amazing what God does. I love reading the Proverbs every day. So this morning in chapter 9, these words came to my heart. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will still be wiser. Uh, Benny Tate, wow, what an incredible challenge. But uh, he quoted Adrian Rogers. Adrian Rogers used to say, if you'll receive the light God gives you, God will give you more light. If we refuse the light, we will live a good bit of our life in darkness. And so I love that part. Give instruction to a wise man, 
and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And listen to this promise. For by me, your days will be multiplied, and the years of your life will be added to you. Now, some of the people from Woodstock that are here with me tonight, uh, Secretary Purdue, I'm not sure how they're going to deal with you later on at our uh, reception. Uh, I thought in the back of my mind without ever telling anyone about when I would retire. But when I went to your 70th birthday party and you started talking about your next eight years, I thought, I'm not quitting either. If he can uh, take this position with the tight budget and the number of people that answer to him, I can continue to lead a little Baptist church. So uh, we're in trouble. I love the book of Titus. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 6, the Bible does this one thing. It says to exhort leaders to be sober-minded. If you like teaching the Bible, you begin to write down and you think, here's the one thing, teach them to live sober-minded. But what else? And he doesn't say anything else. He gives one exhortation, and then he, he follows up with seven emulations. And what I've found as a spiritual leader and certainly seen displayed in both your lives is that we do have platforms to exhort, but we'll never be any stronger than the lives that emulate the truth that we declare. And so there's declaration, but there's also bodily living out the truth. So when he says live sober-minded, since it's the only challenge in the text, and he's raising up leaders in the largest Mediterranean island of Crete, it suggests the exercise of self-restraint that governs all passions and desires. It's a call to self-control, which, remember, is the fruit of the Spirit of God. So we can't live in check on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit of God to bring about this self-discipline. It's the careful management of one's life. It's the cultivate balance and self-restraint. Here's a great one-liner. The more freedom granted, the more self-control needed. And so a friend of mine a few years ago asked a question. How many identifiable leaders can we find in the Word of God? So from Genesis to Revelations, how many leaders are there? Second question, how many can we ascertain finished faithful? And the bottom line is, we are known as we serve in our present times, but we will be remembered by how we finished. And so with that in mind, how many did finish of the ones we can identify? And then what were the spiritual characteristics of their life, those who finished well? Question number one. We identified 400 leaders in the Bible. How many of the 400 leaders finished well? 80. Only 20% finished well. 50% of the men that will go for theological education in our denomination will never enter a ministry position. Only 10% that are ministers in America will actually retire doing what God called them to do. And so when someone will stay the course, boy, I would like to know all I can know about their spiritual virtues and characteristics. So in this brief time, I want to share with you the five leading characteristics of the 80 that finished well. My friend Jay Strack would say, if you've got a pen, pencil, lipstick, or mascara, you might want to write these down. Or, or you'll be on your way home saying, well, what was that number three? Number one was humility. Humility is power under control. It's a biblical word that is very picturesque. It pictures a stallion that still has all of its power, but it's been brought under the bit and bridle of its master. And so a, a man that's a man's man, a woman that stands tall for God, is an individual that humbles themselves before the Lord. A study was done by Warren W. Wiersbe, and he's one of my favorite writers. And Wiersbe said that he wanted to see what Jesus ever said about himself that pertains to his own character. He said, and it is true, Jesus never said, I am holy. 
The Bible says it, but Jesus never said it. Uh, the Bible never speaks of Jesus in red letters saying, I am love. The only spiritual characteristic that Jesus ever mentioned of his own life is in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Take my yoke and upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly, which are the words for meekness, and you will find rest for your souls. It is amazing when a person humbles themselves under the mighty hand of God, God will lift them up in due time. Uh, the Bible teaches that a man's promotion does not come from the north or the south or the east or the west. God puts one man up and God brings one down. Only Jesus can elevate a person in promotion and keep them there regardless of the circumstances and challenges of their ministry. Number two is intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. I was writing something recently and I noticed reading a chapter of a new book I'm working on that I put it in the new book. A good way to remember what intimacy is, is when you're praying, say it this way, Lord, in to me, see. When we're more concerned over what he sees in here instead of what others see out here, what a tremendous difference and witness it becomes for King Jesus. I uh, wanted to make sure I got it right, so I just text someone and said, I want to get it with clarity. Uh, Sonny, I received a call the other day from Washington. And the person called and said, I want you to know I'm up here speaking. And I just ran into someone, and when they told me a story, I thought, I've got to call Pastor Johnny and tell him now. The story came from Grace Nelson. She is Senator Bill Nelson's wife from Florida. And she slipped into the chapel at the Capitol. And she went in and she noticed someone on their knees in the altar. And she introduced herself, or really you introduced yourself first and visited with her. And she shared with my friend what an incredible impact it made for her to see you in the chapel on your knees. You may spend time in secret, but it never remains a secret that we spend time in secret. I, every now and then I try to get up early in the morning and try to coin phrases. And I wrote this little phrase not long ago. If you will give your time to the Redeemer, the Redeemer will redeem your time. Because we never seem to have enough time to give King Jesus his due. But when we give our time to Redeemer, he redeems our time. And then a simple statement. If you don't take time to be holy, you won't be. And if we take time to be holy, we will be. Intimacy with God. Number three is obedience. I'm studying some about obedience this summer in my reading. And obedience is just simply obeying God. Another way to say it is, it's not the truth you know that makes a difference. It's the truth you obey. Uh, it's not knowledge. The Bible teaches that knowledge puffs up. There's a little Greek word in the New Testament that's used for knowledge. And it's a word that really connects the dots. And the way it connects the dots is that you take the knowledge and it becomes an active service, an action point in your life. You connect the dots that you don't just know it, that you do it. America in its Christianity is full of people that know what they ought to do. But what a difference it makes in a person's life when they do what they ought to do. Obedience. Number four is faith. And faith is just trusting God. There's already been a reference to it. Um, Sonny preached at First Baptist Church Woodstock last week, and did he ever preach? And in the message, he referenced again the raining, and that w the rain we needed. And really, it takes faith to go bold. Hollywood made fun of Sonny Perdue. The late night talk shows made fun. But while they were making fun of him, God moved. And in faith, God sent rain. And I don't know if you remember or not, it rained so much, 
we called the governor and said, you need to pray again or we're going to have to build an ark. And so Ken Ham heard about it and did. <laughs> and then last of all is the ability to receive counsel. The ability to receive counsel. The Bible speaks of how there's safety in the multitude of counselors. Everybody needs a godly man or godly woman in their life that they receive counsel from. Someone to speak into their life. Someone that can say, how am I doing? What do you think? The Bible would call it a faithful friend. Now listen to this. Everyone needs a faithful friend. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. We got too much kissing up and not enough faithfulness. And when the Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend, I will remind all of us, wounds hurt. But when wounds that hurt are healed, we become a better person. So genuine love will give rebuke in order to manifest the truth, and it leads to gratitude. Proverbs 28, 23 says, he who rebukes a man will find more favor afterward than he who flatters with the tongue. I, uh, I was reading on the plane coming over, and it's something I uh, have tried to process. And that is, how do you rebuke someone? <laughs> uh, if you just come right up and say, there's something I want to say to you. Mo most likely, you will not get the type response that you had hoped for. Matter of fact, when God wanted to bring rebuke to David, think about it. He brought a faithful friend by the name of Nathan. Nathan didn't go in and say, you're wrong, you ought to get right with God. He told him a story. And the story was not about him to start with. It was about someone else. That's what a faithful friend does. And as he told it, he was hoping that he would understand, I've done sort of the same thing. And I've tried to come up with four or five different ways to really speak into someone's life. Kind of slip up on them, tell a story, and it remind them, settle in on their own heart. Uh, to see the truth. But Nathan, after telling a story that was likened unto what David did, simply said, thou art the man. That's a faithful friend. And as a result, the New Testament does not have one negative word to say about David. I want you to think about that. Here's a good statement to close on. Anything we bring up to God, God never brings up to us again. What a faithful friend. Thank God for faithful friends. And Sonny, you've been just that. You've been a faithful friend. When I went through, uh, what, what was it? A, a dark night of my soul, a deep depression in my life, you called and said, come spend the night with me. Knew you would make my wife happy. Took us to a NASCAR race. And... Um, Cook me dinner. And the governor's name. You don't forget things like that. Uh, you have faithful friends that I believe surround you that will tell you the truth. One reason I feel so encouraged in my soul about this country and its leadership is because one of the people that sits on the cabinet with President Trump, I know, knows God. And I know there's others. So thank you for being a faithful friend, and may God use you to be a faithful friend to our president. Thank you, Pastor Johnny, Pastor Benny, for those words. I know that the only thing standing between you and food is me, okay? So I realize that. And I'm going to be brief. This is a commissioning service. And so in a moment, we're going to have an opportunity to pray over, to pray for mom and dad as we send them out. But uh, before we do that, I want to describe what we're doing. When you hear the word missionary, what do you think of? If you're a Southern Baptist, most likely you think of somebody named Lottie Moon or Annie Armstrong. Two ladies that we've never met. We might know a little bit about their stories, but it's somebody who packs up and maybe goes around the world, somebody that goes to the middle of Africa to take care of orphans or to take the gospel to the most 
far-reaching tribes across the globe. Those are certainly missionaries. That's absolutely what they are. But I want you to understand that missionary is not limited to somebody like that. And the word missionary applies, in my opinion, and I believe biblically speaking, to a business owner, a husband, a father, a grandfather who will serve his country in an uncomfortable way because God is calling. A missionary is someone who will, while he has everything rolling like it's supposed to right where he is with his business and his family and his kids and his grandkids, will, will pick up and move to Washington, D.C., which we all know needs more missionaries, and be faithful and obedient to God. A missionary is someone who who listens when the president calls, who listens when the country calls, but most importantly, listens when God calls. And so what we're doing tonight in this commissioning service is certainly praying for mom and for dad, but we are commissioning two more missionaries. Out of Second Baptist Church, to Washington, D.C., to the cabinet of the president, to the United States Department of Agriculture and its Forestry Service, and to so many more who will be impacted by this new ministry. When you think of the word missionaries, don't, don't just think of those that carry the Bibles into China or those that uh, take the gospel to the tribes of Africa. But put people like Sonny and Mary Purdue on your prayer list as they serve as missionaries in D.C. When you think of the word hero, what do you think of? Now, most of us think of a, a man in a cape or a mask, some dude dressed up like a bat, some guy that can fly and has x-ray vision. These are, these are people we think of when we talk about heroes. Or maybe here in Warner Robins we'll think of those who willingly serve in the military, armed forces, specifically here the Air Force, who are willing to serve and lay down their life for their country, for our freedom, certainly those are indeed heroes. But I think a hero is a dad, a mom, who set an example of faithful obedience to the Lord no matter what. Who show their children, their church, their grandchildren, their family, what it means to genuinely follow Christ and say, wherever he leads, I'll go. And so I think that each and every one of us have the opportunity to be a missionary, to be a hero, because what it means is simply taking the message of the gospel with you wherever God has called you and setting the example of faithful, consistent obedience. If that's on the cabinet of the President of the United States, or if that's on the Air Force Base, or if that's in the pastorate, or if that's across the globe, then we're all called to be that type of person. And I'm thankful, I'm grateful that as mom and dad go to Washington to do right and feed everyone, that's the new USDA motto, do right and feed everyone. As they go to Washington, D.C., they're going first and foremost with the call of God. They're wanting to be faithful and obedient to whatever the Lord has for them. And the example for each and every one of us is to do whatever God calls us to do, to hold on to whatever He's put in our hands loosely, with open hands, palms up, and then to walk faithfully in obedience no matter what. And so tonight, we are commissioning two more missionaries from Second Baptist Church who serve in a unique place at a very unique time, but by God's appointment. And we firmly believe as family, as His church family, and as dear friends that God has you here for such a time as this. And we are so grateful to you both for your willingness to serve. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask if both of you would come here and stand 
right at the front, mom and dad. And we have family here. If you're comfortable, you can kind of gather around. We have deacons and pastors. And up until just a few months ago, mom and dad led a life group here at Second Baptist Church. And uh, so we lost one of our life group leaders. Um, but I'm going to ask if some of those of you from the life group would kind of gather around. If y'all would kind of come over now, we're going to have a time of prayer. Uh, if y'all would just kind of gather around, we have and deacons, Sunday school teachers, leaders, Pastor Johnny, Pastor Benny, Miss Janet, if y'all would come. And anybody, anybody can come and just kind of gather around us here in this moment as we have a time of prayer to commission Sonny and Mary Purdue to this new ministry, this new mission endeavor. What an awesome opportunity what an incredible blessing and what what a wonderful example and I know that you are praying right there in your seat as we pray here would you join me as we pray God I want to thank you that we can say confidently we will never regret steps taken in obedience to Jesus. So I thank you for mom and dad. I thank you for their obedience. I thank you for their faithfulness and I thank you for their example. I thank you for the joy in the journey of taking steps of faith no matter what. And I thank you that you've got another missionary in Washington, D.C. Who sets the example of what it means to live for Christ. Who shares his faith and lives his faith. And I pray that you would use mom and dad in significant kingdom ways to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ and the message of the good news. God, I want to thank you that you've called each and every one of us to faithful obedience. In this moment, in this time, we as a church, the body of Christ, send out Sonny and Mary Purdue to be missionaries in this next endeavor. And we know, Lord, you do not just go with them but you go before them. You lead them and you guide them. You protect them and you keep them. Lord, each and every step of the way, may their theme continue to be, I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus. Thank you for so many gathered here tonight as we pray, as we celebrate, and as we honor. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ.